So welcome to Sunday School. This is now the sixth lesson in our series on spiritual warfare and the full armor of God. We're on the second piece of the armor, the breastplate of righteousness. So today, we're going to look at nine ways in which this truth helps protect us from the schemes of the devil. We're going to consider why the fact that Christ is our righteousness is so helpful in our warfare. So, number one, this truth that Christ is our righteousness, it is a rebuke to our own self-righteousness and pride. It's a rebuke to our own self-righteousness and pride. One of, the de- one of the ways that the devil loves to get at us is through the pride of life. The pride of life is part of the unholy trinity that John speaks about in 1 John 2.16. There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, or we can refer to it as the unholy trinity. And I I came across something by the Puritan Theophilus Gale that I thought was helpful in distinguishing these three different sins. Uh, I thought he did a really good job of it, so I wanted to read it to you. He says, the worldly man's unholy trinity is the lust of pleasure, riches, and glory. The lust of the flesh is the inordinate delight in sensual pleasures of any kind. Recreations, eating, drinking, or partaking of any unclean object. Oh, how the pampering of the flesh tends to the starving of the soul. Like that line. And then, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes sets itself on riches as the choicest good. Oh, how greedy is the covetous man's eyes after gold and silver. And then thirdly, the pride of life. The pride of life looks for any worldly grandeur as its best good. Such men may scorn sensual pleasures or riches, yet they are not without violent and impetuous lustings after the acclamations and adulations of men. Love of the world is a violent bent of the heart toward the world, making the world the center of gravity. I like the way he put that. Oh, what an infinite weight is love to this dirty world. It presses the heart downward, like that force of gravity pulling us down to earthly things and even unto hell. Oh, how the sensual man's heart is bent toward his pleasures, the greedy toward his riches, and the ambitious toward his honors. These become their gods. So I thought that was helpful in being able to distinguish the the unholy trinity here. Another way we could look at it is the lust of the flesh is the pursuit of pleasure. The lust of the eyes is the pursuit of profits. And the pride of life is lusting after position and power and prominence. Or if we want a different alliteration, we could say the lust of the flesh is the pursuit of gluttony. The lust of the eyes, gain, and the pride of life, glory. Or once more, the lust of the flesh, hedonism. The lust of the eyes, hoarding. The pride of life, honor. So that's the unholy uh, trinity there that, that John speaks of. And I think at the root of all of these is pride, and obviously, specifically, the pride of life. And each of us is going to be susceptible to all three of these, but perhaps there's one of those three that we're particularly um, struggling with. And I know for me, that would be the pride of life. The pride of life is a darling sin for me. It is. I confess that I crave approval. I crave recognition and affirmation. I crave the applause of men. I do. It's something I have to battle with all the time. Mortification of that sin. I have to repeatedly remind myself of what Christ has said. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. The Father does not reward pride of life. And what kind of righteousness is Jesus speaking of here? When he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people, he's speaking of our imparted righteousness. And in that Sermon on the Mount, he talks about when you pray, you should have a prayer closet. You should do it in secret so that you're not being seen by by other people. If you fast, don't make a big show of it. 
etc. So we're not to be doing things so that we can be recognized by others. Again, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31, we read this. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, uh, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Something I want to point out in, in this verse here is you actually see imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness side by side. When Paul says, he became to us wisdom from God, he became to us righteousness, there he's referring to that imputed righteousness. He became to us the righteousness that we needed. And he also became for us the sanctification that we needed. He provides us with the Spirit, again, who helps us in that sanctification to produce that imparted righteousness. But getting back to our point here, God has chosen the foolish, the weak, and the lowly to shame the world so that no one has any room for boasting. God will not share his glory with another. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. Yet, I, I love to touch God's glory. I love to take that spotlight off of Christ and put it onto myself. Calvin has said that in every one of us, there is an idol factory that's producing idols. And for me, the idol that is most often produced from my idol factory is a bust of my own head. I feel like I'm constantly having to stand next to the conveyor belt of this idol factory. And as another bust of myself comes out, I have to try to push it over. Stop it, Brooke. Stop. Stop. It's not about you. Pride of life is my Achilles heel. And the best way to shut down this idol factory, at least temporarily, is to meditate on the righteousness of Christ. To remember that without his righteousness imputed to me, he would push me and all of my idols of self into hell if it wasn't for his imputed righteousness. The best way to rebuke this sin is to recognize that when we have high views of self, we have low views of Christ. Therefore, the cure is to have higher views of Christ, and in turn, that will give you lower views of self. The more we esteem the righteousness of Christ, the more we think about the perfection of his righteousness, the more we will see how frail and feeble our own imparted righteousness is in comparison. In the final judgment spoken of in Matthew 25, when Christ is separating all of the nations, all of mankind to his right and to his left, he is separating all of his people, his sheep who hear his voice to the right, And he separates all of those who are the goats, the unbelieving world, to his left. But he says something to the sheep. He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then it says, the righteous... (coughs) It says the righteous with referring to the sheep. Isn't that interesting? He's commending their righteousness. He says the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we do these things? When did I see you hungry and give you food? When did I see you thirsty and give you drink? I don't remember doing that. When were you naked and I clothed you? When were you a stranger and I visited you? or you were sick or in prison, and I visited you. Notice the response of the sheep. The response of the sheep is one of total humility. Total humility. They they don't even recall doing these things. That's how humble they are. 
and this is why Christ refers to their acts as being righteous, our imparted righteousness is only commendable when it is completely immersed in humility. When we become blinded to our own deeds of righteousness because we've been staring at the sun. His righteousness. Just as if we stare at the sun, S-U-N, long enough, we'll become blind. Well, spiritually, it's the same thing. But we want to stare at the sun, S-O-N, his glory and his righteousness. Because, and it keeps us blinded from our own imparted righteousness and, and taking unto ourselves that self-righteousness and pride. Therefore, meditating on the truth that Christ is our righteousness is a rebuke to our own self-righteousness and pride. Secondly, this truth that Christ is our righteousness, it's a regulation of our corporate and private worship. It helps to regulate our corporate and private worship. We can worship God in spirit and truth only by virtue of the fact that Christ is our righteousness. When we enter into worship, whether public or private, when we have our breastplate of righteousness on, our minds consciously aware of the fact that we're loved of God and accepted by God, not because of anything that we've done, but only because of the righteousness of Christ, then and only then are we worshiping him in spirit and in truth when we have our breastplate of righteousness on. Satan loves to go after our worship. He gets us to marginalize or to forget to apply the fact that our redemption and God's acceptance of it is wholly dependent upon the righteousness of another and not on our own merit and goodness. Thus, the truth that Christ is our righteousness helps to regulate our corporate and private worship. Thirdly, this truth that Christ is our righteousness is a rationale for forgiving and loving others. It's a rationale for forgiving and loving others or a motivation to do that. Paul's already told us not to be angry with each other and unforgiving because this gives opportunity to the devil to stir up dissension and division among us. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What's interesting is the word that's used here for tender-hearted. When he says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, that word tender-hearted in the Greek is you splanknoi. So it's splanknon again, the intestines, the bowels. And when you put you in front of it, E-U, it means good or well. So the idea there of tender-heartedness is having good bowels towards one another. Be tender-hearted. If you recall again that word splanknon in the New Testament, it refers primarily to that gut-level compassion. It, it's that capacity to feel deep emotions and especially sympathy and compassion. And when you think of sympathy and compassion, what is that but it is having tenderness towards others? It's others-minded. To have compassion and sympathy is to have pity on others, to be tender towards others. It's others-minded. Thus, when we neglect to think and live in light of the fact that Christ is our righteousness, when we take our breastplate of righteousness off because we're forgetting that, we become sitting ducks for the enemy. And he fires arrow after arrow after arrow hitting our chest and, and hitting our intestines, hitting our affections, stimulating them wrongly. He fires arrow after arrow into our intestinal vital organs until we be begin to profusely bleed out disordered affections. With our breastplate off, the enemy seeks to eviscerate our sympathy and compassion and tenderness towards others, especially amongst us as brethren. And in this state, we become unforgiving and unloving. Thus, we can see how the doctrine of justification is a rationale for loving 
and forgiving others. The breastplate of righteousness is an ever-present reminder to us of what we've been forgiven of and how much it cost Christ for us to be forgiven, how much it cost him to secure this breastplate for us. The doctrine of justification demands that we put aside our grudges, our resentments, our unforgiveness, our unkindness toward our brethren because they're equally justified and accepted before God. Anything that a brother or sister may have done to you, as irritating and as offensive as it may have been, that's pettiness compared to what you've been forgiven. It's petty. How can we not forgive others when we have been forgiven so much by God? How can we look down on other sinners when we know that we are unacceptable before God without the righteousness of Christ? Thus, the imputed righteousness of Christ is a rationale for forgiving and loving others. Fourthly, this truth that Christ is our righteousness is a rebuttal for an accusing conscience and an accusing devil. Why even go to church? Why? Why bother praying? Why bother reading your word? How could you even call yourself a Christian with so much sin and corruption in your life? God doesn't want to listen to you. God doesn't want to speak to you. You're not worthy to approach God without first making things right, offering some penance. Go and clean up your act first. That's of the devil. And we talked about this last week, didn't we? The enemy loves to take aim and, and pierce our heart with his poison-tipped arrows and poisoning our conscience, working it in to that component of the mind to where that, that poison makes us hypersensitive to our sin, almost producing in us an, a spiritual anaphylactic shock in which our affections become unresponsive to the stimulations of the means of grace, that, that sternal rub of the means of grace. And then our will has to come in and try to perform spiritual CPR to revive our person. Many Christians who are assaulted in this fashion, they lose their assurance and they fall into a state of depression, despondency, even backsliding. Why? Because they believe these false accusations of their accusing conscience and the devil. Well, why do they believe these false accusations? Because they've not been keeping their conscience properly informed, as we've talked about. One of the ways we do that is to remember the doctrine of justification. Because they've forgotten the truth that Christ is their righteousness. Or they're just simply not applying that truth in their thinking. They're not putting on the breastplate. The devil wants us to think that we have to earn our salvation through good works. He tries to convince us that we're paupers instead of adopted children to the king. He wants us to forget that our acceptance with God, it's not performance-based. It's not based upon how well or poorly we do in terms of our obedience. He wants us to forget that God does not judge us based on some meritorious metrics system. He wants us to forget that we always have access to the Father through the righteousness of Christ, our great high priest. He certainly wants us to forget Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22 having confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and having a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We can still have an evil conscience. We talked about that, the total depravity of man. It still affects our conscience, which is why we have to keep it properly informed. We need to draw near with that true heart. Our conscience, will, and affections disciplined according to the truth of the doctrine of justification. The breastplate of righteousness is how you silence your falsely accusing conscience. It's how you resist the devil's false accusations and his assaults against your salvation. <clears throat> 
Fifthly, this truth that Christ is our righteousness, it's a rule for our emotions. It's a rule for our emotions. As we observed last week, both the Greeks and the Jews considered uh, the, the bowels or the intestines to be the seat of our affections, the seat of our emotions. And the breastplate, as we've already said, protects our spiritual bowels. And our emotions, as we talked last week about this, they're, they're always changing. They're always in flux. As our affections are being stimulated in various ways, positively and negatively. And so because of this, I don't always feel justified and accepted in the presence of God. And I'm sure that's the case for you. There are times where you just don't feel like you're justified or accepted. But we can get off that emotional roller coaster ride if we simply bring our mind back to this doctrine of justification. If I remember the fact that God's affections have always been set upon me, always, even before the foundation of the world. In fact, it was God's affections for me and for you that sent Christ into this world so that he could be our righteousness. That's what John 3.16 is all about. At the end of the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he's prophesying over his son. He's prophesying over John. And he says that John is going to prepare the way for the Messiah, that he will give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. But why? Why is God doing this? Why is God sending his son to bring salvation through the forgiveness of sins? Why is God sending the Lord to be our righteousness? Verse 78 tells us, because of his affections of compassion toward us. Because of God's affections and compassion toward us, and guess what the word is in the Greek? Splanknon. Because of his bowels of compassion toward us. God's bowels of compassion, his affections have always been set upon us, and it's for this reason that he sent his only begotten son into the world to be our righteousness. Moreover, Christ, the son, his affections have always been set upon us. Indeed, that was what drove him to lay down his life for us and to impute his righteousness to us. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. The joy. What joy? How could anyone find joy in pursuing the cross? How could anyone find joy in suffering the, the painful and shameful death of the cross? More than that, suffering the wrath of God. Where's the joy in that? Well, it was the joy of us. The joy of procuring for us, you and me, the righteousness that we needed to be accepted by the Father. That's what drove him, his love for us, so that we could be adopted as children of God, so that he could bring many sons to glory, so that he could call us friends. There's no greater love than this, but that a man would lay down his life for his friends. He did that to call us friends. His affections for us, for you and me, drew him to the cross so that he could give us this, this breastplate of righteousness. That's why he did it. I want you to have this. You need this. This is going to justify you before my Father so that you can be with me wherever I am for all eternity. Therefore, we can always warm the hands of our affections by the eternal flames of his affections for us. And in so doing, we can bring stability to our emotions when we're not particularly feeling justified or accepted. Because we know this truth that Christ's righteousness, it never changes. And the love that motivated him to secure this righteousness for us, that never changes. We have something that we can always count on, something that we can always hold on to, to keep us from despondency and spiritual depression, to keep us from the tyranny of our feelings. Thus, the breastplate of righteousness can keep us from being ruled by our emotions. Sixthly, this truth 
that Christ is our righteousness, it's a reassurance in prayer. It's a reassurance in prayer. The fact that we can come before God anytime we want, any place that we're at, that we can enter into that spiritual holy of holies, that's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous blessing. But how did we get it? We got it, again, from the righteousness of Christ, his imputed righteousness to us. And so we don't have to be of a certain sex, we don't need to be male, and a certain type of male, circumcised, and of a certain tribe, tribe of Levi, of a certain nation, the tribe of Israel, a certain position, the high priest, and only at a certain time of the year. No, we can enter into the spiritual holy of holies 24-7 because he has made us priests that are holy and acceptable, justified. Again, we not only have the freedom to approach him as priests, but as sons, as adopted sons. And where does that freedom come from? It comes from having been redeemed by the blood, the perfect blood of our elder brother. <clears throat> our elder brother, and he's not ashamed to call us brother or friend because his affections are always set upon us and have always been set upon us. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness as a throne of grace and not as a throne of judgment because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Our access so pay attention to this. Our access to the throne is based on our justification, not our sanctification. It's based on our justification, not our sanctification. It's based upon the imputed righteousness that we've been given, not our imparted righteousness. But very often we avoid praying or we put it off because we feel, or I'm sorry, we fall back into our default mentality of a works-based righteousness. We erroneously assume that we have to be good enough or a certain caliber of righteous before we can enter into God's presence by way of prayer. We forget that our access is based not on our sanctification, but on our justification. James tells us that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. The prayer of a righteous man, righteous, avails much. And he gives Elijah as his example. And I'm sure that many of you, just as I have, when you come across that text, you think, okay, yeah, but James, that's Elijah. I mean, come on, man, this is the guy who called fire down from heaven. I'm never going to be as holy as Elijah. Was Elijah any more righteous than you or I? Did God listen to Elijah because he was some kind of sanctified superhero? because he had some surplus of imparted righteousness to barter with that we don't have? No. The whole point that James makes there is that Elijah was no different from you or I. He says he was a man with a nature just like ours. His prayers were not effectual because he was at level nine sanctification, way up here, which is just one under 10, and we're way down here at one. That's not how we're to think. His prayers were effectual because he was justified in Christ, just the same as you and me. Elijah is not more justified in comparison to you or I. No saint in the kingdom of God is more justified than another. No saint is more justified in Christ's kingdom than another. We're all equally justified by his imputed righteousness. Therefore, the access that we have to God in prayer is based on our justification through righteousness of Christ it's not based on our sanctification. The least sanctified Christian and the most sanctified Christian, the least and the most sanctified, have equal access to the throne of grace. I love this quote from William Cowper. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. He still trembles because he knows they're justified and he knows that the Lord will listen. Hopefully you see then, brethren, how the doctrine of justification, it keeps us at the throne of grace, and it's a reassurance of prayer. Number seven, this truth that Christ is our righteousness, it's the impetus for our obedience. It's the impetus for our, our obedience. 
for pursuing imparted righteousness. Why do we obey God? Why do we want to look into the law of God and understand its application? Why do we want to be like Christ? To earn our way to heaven? No. Because if I don't, God's not going to accept me? No. It's out of thankfulness and gratitude. Because he's saved us. Because he's imputed his righteousness to us. Therefore, it motivates me out of thankfulness and gratitude to pursue that righteousness myself. As Spurgeon remarks, this is, this is Spurgeon here, you will not find on this side of heaven a holier people than those who receive into their hearts the doctrine of Christ's righteousness. When the believer says, I live on Christ alone, I rest on him solely for salvation, and I believe that, however unworthy, I am still saved in Jesus, then there rises up as a motive of gratitude this thought. Shall I not live to Christ? Shall I not love him and serve him, seeing that I am saved by his merits? The love of Christ constrains us, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. If saved by imputed righteousness, we shall greatly value imparted righteousness. Thus says Spurgeon, Christ's imputed righteousness is therefore the impetus for our obedience, our imparted righteousness. Number eight, this truth that Christ is our righteousness, it emboldens us as soldiers. It emboldens us as soldiers. The imputed righteousness of Christ, by defending the conscience, it fills the Christian soldier with courage in the face of death and danger. It fills us with courage in the, in the face of, of any danger and even in the face of death. Whereas guilt, which is nakedness of the soul, guilt is nakedness of the soul, Guilt puts the stoutest unbeliever into a, a shaking fit of fear. For he's always exposed, not having any breastplate for protection. As we read in Proverbs 28, verse 1, The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. They say that sheep are scared from the clatter of their own feet as they run. So is the unbeliever with the racket of his own guilt. Think about Adam. Adam was made upright. When God had finished creating everything, he looks upon it, and it's good. It's very good. And Adam was made upright, as we learn in Ecclesiastes. He was, he was righteous in the eyes of God. So he had a breastplate of righteousness, but then he sinned. And when he sins, what happens to that breastplate? It immediately falls off. And note what happens. No sooner did Adam's breastplate fall off, and he suddenly found his soul to be naked. But he's afraid of God's voice, as if he had never been acquainted with God before. He's all, all of a sudden, he's afraid because he doesn't have that righteousness protecting him any longer. We can never truly have courage if we have not righteousness. But having put on the imputed righteousness of Christ, we can take courage in our warfare knowing that God, if God be for us, who can be against us? As it says in 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if our heart, and specifically the conscience, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If we can have confidence before God, if God is no longer our enemy, indeed, if God is on our side and fights on our behalf, is there any affliction, any adversity, any foe that I should be afraid of? Psalm 27.1 if the Lord is my light and my salvation, if Christ is my righteousness, whom then shall I fear? Who? 
If the Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? The truth that Christ is our righteousness should embolden us as soldiers, to be soldiers of grit and metal. Soldiers that are made of sterner stuff because their sternum is properly protected by impenetrable righteousness. Thus, the truth that Christ is our righteousness, it emboldens us as soldiers. And finally, number nine, I wish I had ten just for symmetry, but (laughs) number nine. The truth that Christ is our righteousness, it is the remedy for discontentment and anxiety. It's the remedy for discontentment and anxiety. What's the most important thing that any person needs? What's the most important thing? Food? Clothing? Shelter? Righteousness. That's the most important thing that anyone needs in this world, is righteousness. Because without righteousness, a person is lost and condemned for all eternity. What does it matter if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You could have all the food and clothing and shelter you want. You could have the whole world. But what does it matter if you've lost your soul? If you don't have righteousness, without righteousness, man remains an enemy of God and cannot be reconciled to God. As a result, unregenerate man can never be content. He can never be at peace. He can never be at rest. But for us, who've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having been justified by the blood of Christ, we don't need to fear the wrath of God any longer. Consider what the writer of Hebrews argues in chapter 2. Since, therefore, we share in flesh and blood, since all of us share in flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise partook of the same things, flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Christ has set us free from that. He set us free from the fear of death, from that lifelong slavery that had our conscience just constantly condemning us. He continues and says, it's not for angels that he helps. He didn't become an angel to save angels. He took on flesh and blood to help the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he's, he had to be made like his brothers in every aspect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Why? <clears throat> to make propitiation for the sins of his people. In other words, so that he could impute his righteousness to us. Because Christ is truly man and truly God, because he was made to be like us in every respect, Because he lived a perfectly righteous life, and because of his substitutionary death and the imputed righteousness that he won for us, he has delivered us from the fear of eternal death, from God's wrath, which had kept our conscience in a state of lifelong slavery. We are no longer slaves to death. Hear me when I say this and let it, let it sink in. The greatest stressor of the soul has been abolished. The greatest stressor of man's soul that has haunted him all his days, has haunted us all of our days, it has been abolished because we are in Christ and his righteousness has been imputed to us. The wrath of God has been satisfied. The sting of death has been removed. Knowing this, we can be content, we can have peace that surpasses understanding because we've been reconciled to God by the righteousness of Christ. If we have the righteousness of Christ, we have everything. We have everything. 
And brethren, because we stand in Christ, we not only have his righteousness imputed to us and the forgiveness of all of our sins, but we also look forward to having an eternal existence with him, our Savior, forever in glory. So what if I have aches and pains right now? Who cares? So what if, I'm, if I have a terminal disease? Who cares? So what if I don't have all the money that I'd like to have to buy this or that? What does it matter? You're not in hell. And you're going to heaven. And, and more than that, you're on your way to heaven now. And when you get there, you will be even as he is. Think about that. Take your justification syringe every day. Take, take your justification syringe every day, as if you're a diabetic who needs insulin, and inject your mind with that truth every single day. That is putting the breastplate of righteousness on. The Christian who is full of discontent and anxiety is the Christian who's not thinking of his justification very much. This is a Christian who has taken off his breastplate of righteousness. The doctrine of justification should bring rest to our souls. Sin is a weary burden. It, it weighs us down. The guilt and the condemnation that we deserve. But having been justified, we are set free from the weight of our sin. We don't have to be heavy laden with guilt any longer. And we no longer need fear death and the judgment to come. Justification is meant to give rest from all of this. In closing, I'd like to quote Charles Spurgeon one more time. It will always give a Christian the greatest calm, quiet, ease, peace to think of the perfect righteousness of Christ. How often are the saints of God downcast and sad? I don't think they ought to be. I don't think they would be if they could always see their perfection in Christ. There are some who are always talking about corruption and the depravity of the heart and the sin that remains in us, and this is quite true, but why not go a little further and remember that we are perfect in Jesus Christ. It is no wonder that those who are dwelling upon their own corruption should wear such downcast looks but surely if we call to mind that Christ has made unto us righteousness, we shall be of good cheer. Though distresses afflict me, though Satan assaults me, though there may be many evil things to be experienced before I get to heaven, still I shall stand firm in the covenant of grace. There is nothing wanting in my Lord. Christ has done it all. On the cross, he said, it is finished. And if it be finished, then I am complete in him and can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. As Spurgeon said, we stand firm in the covenant of grace. We stand firm in the covenant of grace. Stand therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Never take it off. Follow Paul's example. And this will be our benediction. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. In glory we shall no longer need the armor to protect us from the schemes of the enemy, for the enemy will have been fully and finally vanquished. Then the breastplate of righteousness shall be taken off and a crown of righteousness shall be given in its place. We shall no longer be soldiers. We shall be kings. Hallelujah. <laughs>